Hi, and welcome to McGraw-Hill Education's webinar for practical strategies for implementing the Common Core in the real world. We want to thank you for your time today and also thank our presenter, Dr. Douglas Fisher. Dr. Fisher is Professor of Educational Leadership at San Diego State University and a teacher leader at Health Sciences High and Middle College. He is the recipient of an International Reading Association Celebrate Literacy Award, the Farmer Award for Excellence in Writing from the National Council of Teachers of English, as well as a Krista McAuliffe Award for Excellence in Teacher Education. He has published numerous articles on reading and literacy, differentiated instruction, and curriculum design, as well as books such as Better Learning Through Structured Teaching, Common Core English Language Arts in a PLC at Work, and Text Complexity, Raising Rigor in Reading. Thank you again, Dr. Fisher, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. We'll be talking about some practical strategies for implementing the Common Core and with a specific uh, focus on accessing complex text and really working on um, some things we can do right now to have students access those complex texts. When a lot of people hear you know, about the Common Core, especially Anchor Standard 10 and the demands around complex text, the reaction is somewhat like this. It's, it's surprising and scary and shocking. So we're going to think about some other ways, some systems that we can develop and implement to ensure that students have access to those complex texts. Nancy and I have been working on these five access points. So how do we get kids to, to really deeply understand, think about, talk about um, complex text? Uh, some of these are familiar and some of these may be less familiar. <clears throat> so these are our five access points. We'll go in greater detail for each of those. I'm going to start with collaborative conversations. I think this is in a really important place to, to begin our work, um, especially in the transition to the Common Core, that we have to build some of these experiences with our students. It's not enough to just have complex texts in the room. Students need to read and discuss those texts. They need to interact with those texts. One of the challenges is finding those complex texts. Do we have enough material so students can actually read for information in appropriately complex texts? And that's where instructional materials come in is, is to help us figure out what are the right texts. We then have to think about getting kids to talk. Um, it's to, for anyone, for any one of us, to acquire a new language, you have to use it, not merely listen to other people using that academic language. And this is one of the challenges that we see in a lot of schools, that students aren't talking enough, using academic language enough, to, come, to become proficient at it. See, I have a lot of students in my school who speak Farsi and Spanish, um, Oromo, Amharic. I hear those languages all the time, but I'm not fluent in them because I don't produce those languages. To become fluent in a language, academic English or another language, you have to actually use the language a lot. So there's a standard in Common Core. It happens to be my favorite standard. It's Anchor Standard 1 in Speaking and Listening. And that standard calls for students to prepare for and participate in collaborations with diverse partners, building on each other's ideas and expressing their own clearly and persuasively. This is a huge, important standard for us to start dealing with um, to really Im implement the Common Core. We call this the linchpin or the link standard um, here in San Diego because it has a lot to do with the connection between the reading students will be doing and the writing they will be doing. What I've done is I've broken down this standard into its parts um, to look at trends across grade levels. Uh, we need to, to think through what, what it will take to get kids to have these conversations about complex texts. For grades K-2, the big ideas are that students will follow the rules of discussion. Now, I, I highlighted the, the major features of each of these grade bands. Obviously, there are more standards. We have to figure out how to get kids to follow the rules of discussion. We're not always really sure what the rules of discussion are. Um, we need to develop some curriculum that helps us figure out what are the rules. Where, what do we need to do? Is it turn taking and active listening and maintaining a topic? This summer, we're spending a lot of time in our school system designing 
what we think about is the rules of discussion and how to teach those rules. Another thing that has to happen in grades K2 is we have to move from participation to turn taking. We have to get kids to stop waiting for their turn to talk and actually engage in conversations in which they take turns. And they have to learn to sustain the discussion through the use of questioning. These are three big challenges for students who are five and six and seven years old. If you have your own five, six, and seven year olds or have had or teach um, students in this grade band, you know this is really hard stuff. There's a lot of heavy lifting that these primary grade teachers are going to have to do to get students to meet these expectations. Most of the time, kids don't stay on topic. They don't actually listen to their peers. They wait for their turn to talk. Interestingly and importantly, these, these standards in grades K2 are done with adult support. We have the same three big ideas in grades 3 to 5, but without adult support. In addition, we have in grades 3 to 5, helping, uh, having students prepare for the discussion, learning to yield and gain the floor, posing and responding to questions, and then the hard one, moving from explaining their own ideas to explaining the ideas of other, of other people. And this one takes a lot of project work. We have to get kids into a lot of situations where they have to respond to, listen to, and explain <clears throat> the ideas of other people. When we build those strong project works, uh, like we did in, this, uh, in a program called Flex, we built a whole bunch of experiences for kids to move out of just listening and then sharing their own thinking, but really engaging with the ideas of others. As they get a little older, in grades six to eight, they're going to use evidence to probe and reflect. They're going to have collegial discussions that include goals and deadlines. That's another important thing. When we teach kids to set up project teams, and we teach kids to work collaboratively with their peers, they have to learn to set the goals, what are they going to accomplish, and their deadlines. We have to have students ask questions that connect the ideas from multiple speakers, not just questions of a speaker, and then to um, acknowledge that new information. <clears throat> I hope you're seeing that the collaborative conversations demands lighten up as students get older. The heavy lifting for this standard is really in grades K2. Developmentally, that's going to be a stretch for most kindergarten to second graders. If they're doing those things, by the time they're in these grades, this is pretty easy. In grades 9 and 10, they use prepared research, they vote, reach consensus, they ensure a full range of options or opinions, and they summarize and synthesize points of disagreement, not just points of agreement. These are, these are important factors in really building a culture of collaboration, of interaction, of argumentation. And in grades 11 and 12, kind of a little surprise here, it says that in grades 11 and 12, students will have civil and democratic discussions. I think we probably should have had that one down into kindergarten, but it got popped into 11th grade. So that's kind of a weird one. But the other ones are reasonable. Students will um, use questions to probe. They will resolve contradictions. And they'll determine what additional information is needed. This is a, a huge, important standard if we're going to get kids to access complex text. Because that standard says that the talk that students do has to be about grade level topics what is the science and social studies topics that they should be learning for that grade? But they're also talking about grade level texts, the appropriately rigorous texts that students need, as well as the grade level issues, the things that they're struggling with across that grade level. If they're not talking about it, we don't get to hear their thinking. And their writing will probably be compromised. One of the things we have to think about along this is how we assess those texts. How are text complex? In the Common Core, there is a three-part model for text complexity. We look at quantitative measures, qualitative measures, and then the tasks um, that we ask kids to do with those texts. <clears throat> In the past, we've taken an approach of, what can kindergartners do? Let's add a year, let's add a year, let's add a year, let's add a year. And the result has been a gap, that students in most states graduate reading with an expectation of reading at the Lexile level of about 1150. In my own state, that's true. In California, if you graduate on grade level in 12th grade, you read about 1150. Of course, not all kids graduate reading on grade level. But even those who do graduate on 1150 are not reaching college readiness. So the Common Core standards were backward mapped from the college readiness level. 
The research tells us that um, student freshmen um, in college need to read about a Lexile of 1350. Unfortunately, they graduate at a Lexile level of, if they're on grade level, of 1150. So we created this gap in, um, in the students. <clears throat> they graduate unable to read the, the demands of college freshman text. So this time around in Common Core, we're going to start at the 1350 and go backwards. That's why the text complexity demands are such that they are. Nancy and I built this example <clears throat> not too long ago to show where the heavy lifting is going to be on Anchor Standard 10 on complexity. We don't really use quantitative tools in grades K-1 that aren't very reliable, and the Common Core doesn't recommend that. Um, in grades 2 to 3, you can see in the gray were the former Lexile bands, and in the black are the current Lexile bands. So in grades 2 to 3, we, we're pretty good with an overlap. It's a little stretch on both sides. So in grades 2 to 3, we're not asking for students to be reading texts that were harder than they were supposed to be reading last year. The problem is that a lot of second and third graders weren't reading the text complexity bands that they should have already been reading. And if you look up the bands in grades 4, 5, there's less of an overlap. In grades 6, 8, there's less of an overlap, 9, 10, and 11, 12, college career ready. So now it tops out at 1350, 1385, which is where we want kids to graduate high school so that they can read the freshman um, textbooks that are assigned in college. That's the demand here. So the quantitative tools like Lexile, like Atos, like Source Rater, those tools tell us that a text is complex. They don't tell us why a text is complex. To, t to figure out why a text is complex, we have to use qualitative tools. The uh, information inside the circle, those four areas, are right out of Common Core. The information in the box is our best thinking and some analysis of Common Core about what makes a text complex qualitatively. Things like the genre, or the narration, or the organization, or the figurative language. When groups of teachers sit down and look at a text, and they analyze that text qualitatively for the factors of complexity, they generate a bunch of teaching points. We've designed a rubric. Um, it's in our book, Text Complexity. You can find it on our website. We looked at a rubric of three is super hard for kids at that grade level, two is OK for kids at that grade level, and one is um, relatively easy for kids at that grade level in each of these factors of complexity. A bad text would be one that straight threes all the way down, because that would mean the teacher has to do all the heavy lifting. The teacher has to do all of the work. An equally bad text would be a text that was straight ones, that there's nothing really as a teaching point. An ideal text would be a text that has you know, mostly ones and twos and a couple threes that really become the teaching points. To give you an example of this, the first area is level of meaning and purpose. It's about the density, the language that's used, and if there's a clearly stated purpose. You know, For example, this text is about the life cycle of frogs. That makes it easier when the author gives you the purpose. So the sample text that I put in is animal form. It's not too hard in terms of vocabulary. It's not too hard in terms of background knowledge. It's not too hard in terms of sentence structure. You can have a literal read of animal form and, and kind of understand the plot. But if you add the level of meaning, it's not just about animals. It's about the former Soviet Union. And it's a political a satire. And it's very ambiguous. It's, it's not just a straightforward story. What makes animal form hard is the level of meaning, which should be the teaching points. In terms of structure, there's organization and, and genre and narration and features of the text. Sometimes these contribute to the complexity. For example, in the book Voices from the, in the Park, <clears throat> the narrator changes four times. And a point of view of the events in the park change with each narrator. The way the author signals that is by changing the font, which is really confusing. It adds to the complexity of the text. That's what the teacher has to notice, is if this is going to be the teaching point. The third area of complexity are language conventions, the language and register that's used in the text. Sometimes this contributes to the complexity as is in the case of the book Saving Sweetness, <clears throat> which on the first page of text says, out in the hottest, dustiest part of town is an orphanage run by a female person nasty enough to scare night into day. She goes by the name of Mrs. Sump, although I doubt there ever was a Mr. Sump, Sump on account of she looks like something the cat drug in and the dog wouldn't eat. 
our students have a very hard time with this because of the language convention. The West Texas setting and language throws them off. That becomes a teaching point. And the last area of the knowledge demands this is the knowledge what gets, um, gets the complexity raised. Is it the background knowledge, the prior knowledge, the cultural knowledge, the vocabulary knowledge, as is the case in guinea pig scientists. There's a whole bunch of vocabulary in this book that is not defined. So the knowledge demand of this text is really high. Super motivating, the genre is familiar, the sentence structure is not hard, it's informational text, it's problem solution structures. None of that's hard. What's hard is the demand of vocabulary. So we have to start really understanding what makes the text complex, and we have to figure out how to get kids to interact with each other about the text. But simply assigning hard books is not going to get us there. Simply assigning hard books is not going to get kids to read at high levels. We have to actually do some teaching. And that's where the next access point comes in. We have to make sure that students know that there's a purpose and that we do some modeling. We have a purpose for the reading and we model our thinking. We don't want to throw out the babies with the bathwater. We know a lot as a profession about purpose setting, being clear about what we're going to learn today, and we know a lot about how to model. In our modeling, we know a lot about modeling comprehension, and there's all kinds of instructional re resources and materials on modeling comprehension, modeling word solving, modeling text structures like problem and solution or cause and effect or descriptive, and modeling text features. We know how to do this. We should continue to do this in Common Core. We have a lot of evidence that clearly articulated purpose statements and teacher modeling are powerful ways for getting kids to access complex text. Those purpose statements of goals or objectives, learning targets, whatever you call them, that sets our expectation. So the fifth, another access point in our five access points is close and scaffolded reading. And this is probably new. This is probably different than we've done a lot in the past. Close reading has been controversial. I think it's super important that we learn how to do this and do this well. When I think about close reading, it's a form of guided instruction. <clears throat> it's not teacher modeling. If you look down at the bottom, you can see our gradual release of responsibility model that we designed years and years ago. <clears throat> close reading is a form of guided instruction. We're trying to use questions, prompts, and cues to get the learners to do more of the work. It's not modeling. It's not collaborative learning. We need to add this to our guided instruction. In a close reading, we use a short passage. How short? You know, a couple paragraphs to a couple pages. Students reread the text multiple times, each time with a different purpose, a different question. They interact with the text by reading with a pencil that might be writing on the text. That could be sticky notes. We're seeing teachers now use wiki sticks to underline and box in key terms. Students think about and respond to text-dependent questions, and the text should be complex enough that the students actually have to struggle with it. Nancy and I wrote an article on close reading uh, for the reading teacher last November, so um, if, that, if you need access to that article, it's on our Fisher and Fry website, which I'll go back to in a minute. Um, also, the PowerPoints are, in diff are on fisherandfry.com under the resource tab as well. There are some differences in close reading on the grade levels in grades K to 2. It's the teacher who initially reads out loud. If the text is complex enough, the student won't be able to read it in kindergarten or first or second grade. The teacher reads aloud. Students may or may not eventually independently read the text in a close reading. We want to keep their listening comprehension challenged in grades K to 2. In grades 3 to 12, it's almost always that the students read the text first. And then the repeated readings may or may not include teachers reading aloud sections or parts of the text. We just need to remember that in the primary grades, a lot of times the text isn't complex enough to be worthy of a close reading. Our goal with complex text, especially in close reading, is to slow the reader down. We want them to pay attention. We want them to go back. We want them to underline. We want them to look for evidence. Everything we read shouldn't be close reading. There are lots of things we read to find something out for enjoyment, but sometimes we read carefully and closely, and it's an instructional approach that needs to be added. 
scaffolded reading instruction or, or small group instruction is, is around um, meeting the needs of the targeted group of students. There's still a purpose. It's another form of guided instruction. Close reading is one type. Scaffolded reading is another type. In grades K-2, it's often around the foundational skills and comprehension. As students get older, we push on their comprehension with increasingly challenging text in those small groups. And you can add some sampled reading instruction for students who need more support. We want to make sure that in our scaffolded reading instruction, our small group instruction, it's not the text that's doing the work, that the teacher is providing the scaffolds. And sometimes in leveled text with older readers, you know, fourth graders, fifth graders, sixth graders or so, sometimes we see the text serving as the primary scaffold, that it's not the teacher who's doing the scaffolding, it's the text. We want to be careful and make sure that we're leveling students up during scaffolded reading instruction, not only using text at their instructional levels. We want to push them higher because the teacher is there to do the scaffolding. Alfred Tatum reminds us that leveled text can lead to leveled lives. If students are only in leveled text and they're only receiving leveled text in the upper grades, they're probably going to be in leveled text for a lot of years, if not forever. Level texts do improve students' reading performance uh, in the upper grades, but they don't close the gap for students. And I know that sounds controversial, and we're very much into level text. It's working really well in the primary grades while we're learning to read. We need to think about how to keep stretching kids. If you're a fifth grader and you read at the third grade level, and you only have level text at the third grade level because that's your current instructional level, in sixth grade, you'll be a really good fourth grade reader. We need to be the scaffolds getting kids to read more and more and more complex texts. Another access point, um, and something that's being talked about a lot right now with Common Core, with the attention to close reading, and the attention to scaffolded reading, and the attention to these deeper interactions, repeated reading, one of the cautions we have is that we still have to pay attention to the reading volume. We still have to get kids to read a lot of stuff. We don't want to, again, throw out more babies. We want to make sure our kids are still reading a lot of text. Close reading slows us down intentionally. Close reading results in fewer pages read. So we have to make sure we're also attending to the volume issue, whether that's at home reading or at school reading. It still matters to have kids read enough words across the year to build their background knowledge and to build their vocabulary. And the last access point that I want to talk about is about formative assessment. We, to really understand the Common Core state uh, standards and how the assessments will work, we have to get better at formative assessment. It, feedback is not enough. Simply writing all over students' projects and work and writing and math homework and everything is not going to change their achievement. They gave it to us the best way they know how. We have to get really good at feed forward, not just feedback. We need to analyze the student work and determine what we need to still teach. That feed forward involves error, analyzing those misconceptions, doing error analysis on students' work, and then coding those errors. I put an example in here from a compare contrast essay that students were working on. And the teacher was looking for different kinds of errors, like the introductory paragraph contained a summary of the differences and similarities. The student initials in the boxes are the students who did not do this successfully. I don't think we do this enough, this kind of error analysis. Because if you look, period one on transition, there's a lot of kids who need that instruction. There's a whole class reteach there that needs to happen. We do not need to reteach periods three, four, and five about transition. We need to reteach period one. What we need to do in period three is grab those four students and do some more small group instruction. Until we get to this kind of error coding and error analysis, I don't think we actually get to much feed forward instruction. We tend to teach and reteach the average kinds of errors and mistakes students make. And I want to remind us that annotations, the the notes kids make <clears throat> while they read are an excellent source of formative assessment data. If we get kids taking notes on the text, we get a glimpse inside their mind as they're reading. Most of our assessments are after the reading has already been done. When we look at their annotations, especially first read, second read, third read, we get a sense of what they were thinking while they were reading. 
An annotation is a note made while reading. Uh, Mortimer Adler strongly suggested that we annotate with pencils so we can go back and revise our annotations as we learn more. I still see students using pens and highlighters and stylus for their tablets, but ideally they would be reading with a pencil. <clears throat> People have been annotating text since there have been texts to annotate. These are historical museum documents and you can see the margin notes. We've been doing this for decades. I'm not talking about highlighting. That's an overuse that's just reading as your eyes go by, the highlighter goes by. I am talking about slowing down the reader through annotation to deepen the understanding. Here's an example of a student's annotation after multiple reads of Charlotte's Web. <clears throat> you can see where the page ends and the teacher copied it on a larger piece of paper so students could write. This tells you a ton about the student's thinking while the student is reading. Again, you can do it digitally or in print. There are all kinds of apps to do annotation as well. And we can teach kids through um, interactive writing, through language experience approach, to in the primary grades, we can have conversations and then record our notes. We can also use wiki sticks, which is becoming very common, is to have wiki sticks um, to, to annotate so they can come back off after the teacher has assessed. We can do some sticky notes. Uh, and then in grades three to five, in our school system, we're pushing on three kinds of annotation. So the minimum expectation in these grade levels is they will underline major points which takes a lot of teaching to do because when they first start doing this, they underline everything. They circle keywords and phrases and they write question mark in the, in the margin and then write out their question. And kids get very, very good at doing this. Here's an example from a fifth grade. You can see the questions, the highlighting, the margin notes, the underlining. This kid is interacting with this text and the teacher can learn from this. Same class, same text. The student's using all kinds of inferring. We don't really push them to write inferences in the text but they're doing so in that text as they're working. In grades six to eight, Hello? we add, in six to eight, we add um, additional annotations, exclamation marks for things that surprised you with a note, an arrow um, to draw on it, um, connections internal and external to the text. Sorry about the phone ringing. How embarrassing is this? Um, we have them texting in between making connections internal to the text. Here's an example of modeling. Here's an example of a teacher showing how she was doing the annotations. An example of a sixth grade student. This student wasn't doing well. We heard a lot from this uh, teacher who sent it to us until the student started doing annotations. They got deeper and deeper and deeper in the annotations, which helps us figure out what do we still need to teach next. In grades 9 12, we had a couple more. We mark EX when the author provides an example, and we enumerate arguments, ideas, and details, and then write them and restate them in the margin. Here's an example of teacher modeling for ninth graders. Look at the work this teacher is doing to show students her thinking. And then an 11th grader, look at this student's work after multiple readings. We know a ton about students when we go deeper and deeper and deeper into this. Those are the five access points that I think it's really going to take to get kids into common core text complexity. They need to know why they're reading things. They need to hear their teacher's model. They need to have some experiences that are guided instruction related, close and scaffolded reading. They need to be taught to talk a lot about the text and use argumentation. They need to continue to read a lot and we need to assess them. I hope this is helpful to you and I know there's new tests coming so I'm hoping we can keep calm and pass those tests. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you put in the margins in the minutes that are re remaining. And I hope you'll go to fisherandfry.com and look at the resources that we have up there.